listening to the Traditional Outdoors Podcast. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Traditional Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Angel, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Mr. Nick View. And before we get started, I want to take a minute to recognize the winner of our Fly Rod and Reel Combo Giveaway. Mr. Scott Spray of Michigan was our contest winner, so congratulations, Scott. And we also drew a second name in the event that Scott did not claim his prize, and that individual was Mr. Blake Sabo. Now, Scott did claim his prize almost immediately after we posted the drawing on social media, but we're going to send Blake some decals and drink koozies courtesy of Cameron Mortensen of the Fiberglass Manifesto, so congrats also goes to Blake. For everyone else that entered and left us a rating or a review, we do truly appreciate it. And we encourage anyone listening who has not left a rating or review to please take the time to do so. For you see, we will be holding other giveaways in the future, and those drawings will likely be based on all reviews left on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and etc. So you might as well go ahead uh, and get entered by posting your review ahead of time and be ready for the next giveaway. Now, let's get to the podcast. Well, hey there, Nick. How's it going, man? You've been... uh you been getting out and doing anything fun? Yeah, actually, the uh, the Michigan Longbow Association just had their annual spring shoot and membership meeting, and that's the one that kicks off all the shoots for the year, pretty much. Um, that was last weekend, and uh, which is uh, funny enough, it's Aubrey's birthday, my oldest. Um, it was the fourth, fifth, and sixth, and uh, man, we had great weather. Um, it was, it was pretty, pretty warm, you know, it got a little cool at night, but it was still awesome. Um, got the bows out, uh, got to do a lot of shoot. I think I've shot, shot, I shot more at this one than any other spring shoot I've been to. Um, probably because I'm not the president anymore, but (laughs) I shot with, uh, I shot with John, the current president a lot. Uh, We had him on the show back in like episode three. Um, and we shot a lot of rounds together, shot with Rob, our friend Rob, um, Got to shoot with my dad, uh, both my parents actually. Um, it was just a really good time, you know. Got to share a campfire with, uh, you know, a lot of the MLA friends, and got some new members, and and the shooting was all good too. It was just a great courses, and it was nice to get back out with a bow again. And this was uh, the whole family was there with you, right? Yep, and Jess got her. Jess, my wife, got her new bow from uh, Saint Joe River Bows. I saw that. I saw that on Facebook. Did I, did she shoot that uh, all weekend? She did, and I tell you what, she hasn't shot in months. And this thing, is, her old bow was thirty one pounds, and it was a Spectra ply. And this one, she had waterfall babenga and rosewood. She wanted to keep it really simple. Um, stained, it's beautiful chocolate brown. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. And, um, it was 45 pounds and she, you know, she lifts a lot. She likes to, she likes right. to work out. So she, she got a lot stronger in her back and she wanted to start hunting. So I said, why don't you get a 40? And she got a 45 instead. And, you know, she got to pick the grip and everything. Tracy sent her some grips and, and she got everything in and man, she went right on in the course. She shot around with Tracy right away and she shot the lights out. She shot better than she's ever shot. That's and awesome. She hasn't, and she hadn't even picked up a bow. Um, same arrows that you made her. She did the same ones, those those uh, Warriors and the uh, Outlaws. Or no, Warriors and something else. I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. But um, they flew perfect out of it, and she had a blast all weekend long. In fact, she's going to get in the Meyer State games again this year. We're going to shoot that. Awesome. That's, that's so, pretty cool. And y'all had, pre- y'all had pretty good weather for the shoot too, I think, right? Oh, yeah. We had great weather. We had, um, we had a, you know, a little, a little wind. It was real windy Friday. Um, rained a bit on Thursday. It was a little windy on Friday, but sunny and then beautiful on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and you know, we always have a chili cook off on Friday and that was great. I saw Tracy uh, won that. Tracy won that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of really good entries, but in fact, Tracy entered that to make sure they went. Cause as a bowyer, bowyer, they always get overwhelmed and they, they seldom make it this year. She made sure she did. And then they camped until into Saturday and I got to shoot around with David Tracy for the first time since I've known him. I finally got to shoot around with him. Well, that's cool. So, I'm, I'm glad y'all had good weather. We, um, so I, and, and I love the 3d season. Um, mm-hmm. I was, uh, planning to go to the Tennessee classic for a day. I've got, we have a local shoot. So the local club, I mean, we have a 3d shoot the first Sunday of every month. 
and the Tennessee Classic was on the same weekend, but I really wanted to go and, and meet some folks there. And um, the the night before, I called my uh, friend Crispin Henry, and we were talking about going, and he said, you know, I've had a cold. Have you checked the weather? And I thought, well, no, but the weather here is supposed to be really nice. I just assumed it would be there. So I checked the weather that night, and it was, oh, it was abysmal. They were calling for it to start raining at, like, 4 a.m. and 100% chance of rain through, like, 3 p.m., and it's a four-and-a-half-hour drive each way. So I, I couldn't justify it. So I called Crispin back up, and I said, man, we're, we're just not going to be able to do this. So, oh, bummer. Um, but we do, we did, I did get to help set the course for our local shoot, so I felt good about that because it's it's four of us typically, sometimes five, that are setting the course up each week. And, and I kind of felt like I was letting those guys down. So I got to help them set up. And then we had an absolute, except for the pollen, which was almost thick enough. You could write your, your name in it in the air. Uh, we had a really good shoot, um, this past Sunday too. So, uh, a lot of, a lot of fun there. Yeah. And I got to break in a set of arrows too. I, I, you know, I've, I've always kind of shot the last couple of years. I've, I've shot mainly, uh, carbons and, um, I've shot some 2216 aluminums and hunted with both too. Um, but uh, when you when you came to the do you remember, do you recall those arrows I won at the banquet the MLA I do. banquet absolutely yeah they were they were made by a member who had passed a couple of years ago a really really good hunter several African trips uh, Ted Johnson and um, he passed and and his his widow started um, donating pieces of his collection and stuff he had laying around because every archer's just got tons of things we left behind right. or we leave behind. And, and, um, I saw those beautiful, these beautiful cedars with green and yellow crusting and traditional cut. And I had to have them and I won them for like 45 bucks or something like that. And, um, I, they've been sitting there and I've been looking at them and looking at them and looking at them. And after a couple of days of, or after a day of shooting carbons, I, I called my wife and I was like, Hey, can you grab uh can you grab my leather bat quiver and my woods? <laughs> and she and she brought them in. She hadn't left yet, and she brought them in. And um I shot them the rest of the weekend and and man, I I tell you what, it was nice to get out there and sling wood again. Um there's just something about it and those arrows are straight. I mean, just beautiful arrows, old growth. Um I think I'm going to hunt with them this year. I think it'll make a really cool story at least part of the season. Um I don't know what I'm going to use when I come down to Georgia and visit you yet, but um, it would be neat to get one, to get something for Ted. Yeah, you know? well, I, I tell you, whatever you decide to bring, make sure it's make sure it's straight, make sure it's sharp, as as you've been seeing from the from the trail cam photos I've been sharing with you. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a, a a pretty good hunt this year when you come down. Um, well, let's just be, hope, hope the weather hope the weather cooperates this year. Oh, they'll be, they'll be, I'm sure they, I'm sure it will. And it, you know, and they'll be sharp. And, you know, if I get to have you give them a look through, uh, that's what we'll do. But yeah, I, I I'll think still sharpen I, your broadheads for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been jinxing me. I think you curse my arrows. That's why I'm not uh, shooting anything. No, I don't think. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I made I made a hell of an impact on that tree I hit last time, though. Yes, that you did. Say, I did. almost cleave that thing yeah. in half, that sapling. Well, so. I can, I can tell you for certain it, it died. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the, and the, and the trail was short. So Harv- harvested is the proper term for that. <laughs> but, but, but don't get me started giving you a hard time or we'll, we'll be here all night. And mm-hmm. we actually have a great guest lined up tonight. So what do you say? We just jump right into that. That sounds like a good idea. So got another, uh, uh, good friend of mine on the, on the other end. Um, Jay St. Charles is joining us this evening and uh, been really looking forward to this one for a long time. I know we've been uh, going back and forth through uh, instant messages and phone calls and texts with Jay, but uh, I met Jay. Actually, you know, it's funny. I met Jay the same weekend that I met Tom Jurgensen back in February of 2012. It was on the same hog hunt um, down in, in South Carolina. Um, and it was one of those things where, you know, Tom and I just kind of hit it off right off the bat and uh, I think Jay came in like the, a day later um, and didn't get to meet him until the first night. But I remember that first night sitting around the campfire till, oh, it was the early hours of the morning, just 
you know, listening to Jay, uh, talk about bow hunting and, and traditional archery and just all the, all the history and knowledge that he had. It was just one of those things you just wanted to sit there and, and, and soak it up as long as he wanted to talk about it. And we, we stayed up pretty late, but, um, I reached out to him a few weeks ago and, and asked him if he'd like to be on the show. And, and he said, yes. So he's hanging out, been listening to us chat about shooting arrows, and I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to, to jump in and get get started with us so hey jay how's it going man going good going good thanks for having me here i'm glad to be here how's how's life in uh out in washington state on the west coast well we've got we got thick pollen out here too right now (laughs) i uh i i watched some wind blow through one of our cedar trees out here it looked like a dust cloud came out of it so so we got our spring and uh and it's we're we're ready for I'm sur- it. <laughs> I'm surprised it stayed dry. It stays dry enough at any length of time for you to have pollen out there. I don't think I've I've ever been out there more than uh, a, a day and a half that it hasn't rained. Well, I guess the pollen makes up for it. One day of one day of sunshine, it's ready to go. So it's uh, it that went back to raining again for a while today. So uh, that's down again. And, and uh, I'm feeling better for it too. So yeah, you've been you've been, uh, you been carving on any wood today? Yeah, in fact, I'm working on a Thunderbird recurve for a fella in Texas, and uh, a stock bow of the same kind, and and I've got a long bow. I think I might even go out and attack later this evening here. It's it's three hours earlier here, so I might do a second shift for an hour or two, but. Yeah, been keeping busy, making lots of sawdust. You bet. Awesome. I, I know the times I've I've been able to go out there and, and spend a couple of days with you over the past few years. Uh, love love just watching you work on the bows out there. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, Jay. So I'm gonna t- I'm gonna take a step back. And um, now, Jay, I know you've you've pretty much been involved um, with with traditional archery your your entire life. But you know, for for uh, myself and Nick and our, our listeners, you know, give us an idea. How long have you been actually shooting or, or working with traditional archery gear? And, and what's your, what's your earliest memories of actually handling and shooting a bow? Well, I, we, we had a family archery shop, uh, starting in 1949, which is the same year that I showed up. And, uh, so I grew up kind of always surrounded by it, and I, I think I had a bow when I was about three or four, and uh, we had a, a little kind of a walk through a range out behind our archery shop, and uh, so I remember spending some time out there, and we also had a NFAA field course archery club that was a few miles away from us, and that's where we spent a lot of our weekends was over there, and... Uh, there were other families with young kids my age and, and older growing up. And uh, so those were the kids that I first remember, my my young archery companions and all the adults that kind of surrounded that. So, yeah, it was, it was a weekly thing. Uh, and because we had our shop, it was year-round because we, we were sort of a, a central location for all these archers to to hang out and, and to see things and to talk. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what your first bow, the first bow that was, that was Jay's bow. Do you remember? Yeah. The one? first bow was, was a Kavota brothers mosquito. And it had, uh, it was kind of like a little recurve. It had plastic kind of horn looking tips on it. And, uh, I think it was a paper backing and facing on it. You know, it was a laminated bow, and it was pretty cool. I, th- I thought it was like everybody else's bow, you know, like the adult bows. And so I was probably shooting that when I was probably five or six. And uh, that's the first bow I remember. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I had it around for quite a while. I don't know where it is now, though, unfortunately. So... But I have vivid memories. Yeah, I can see it right now. So, and uh, those guys made a lot of bows. Kavota Brothers back east, they made a lot of kids' bows and a lot of what I would call entry level bows. And uh, so that was part of what we sold. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah, it was, it was that was a very it was an archery rich environment, I guess you'd say. <laughs> so I can only imagine. Yeah, so uh now that you've kind of gone into that a little bit, what was it like growing up as St. Charles, Jay? I mean, he well, you know, it's it, just a it's just a legendary name. I got it. I got to know about it. Well, at the time we were we were just other club members back in the, when I was a little kid, and we were the family one of the families that happened to have an archery shop. And uh, but my dad was was uh, he he had had an archery business of one form or another, and he and he'd made bows to sell, and, and he'd help people make bows from about the late 30s onward. And uh, and he'd also kind of made a commitment back then that, that he was going to try to to make a living in archery somehow if he could. And uh, so he had s- several different shops he set up in the 30s and 40s. And then uh, uh, 1949, uh, my he... Uh, he and my mom got married sometime in 48, and then they found a property. It was the site of an old sawmill, uh, about four and a half acres, kind of in the middle of nowhere, south of Seattle. And uh, so they bought that place, and they it had room to, to grow a little bit. And uh, I remember we set up a chicken coop fairly early on, so we had some chickens there. Uh, somebody nearby had a hog farm. My mom used to worry about us, uh, me being out in the yard with the hogs running around occasionally. So it was, it, we were out, we were literally out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, friends told my dad when he, 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 he set up a shop there and it was close to the Cascade Archers archery range, the NFA affiliate archery range. They had a 28 field course there. So that was, that was nearby. But everybody told him, "Heck, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's going to find you. You know, how are you going to are you going to sell anything when 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 nobody lives out there?" And my my dad used to say, "You could you could lay down in the middle of the highway for 20 minutes, you know, and no no cars, you know." <laughs> and it was kind of that way uh, for quite a while. But uh, so we had uh, my my folks started building a shop. My my uh, my mother's father, my dad's father-in-law, was kind of a handy guy as far as being able to build stuff. And he and my dad built this a house for us, just the two of them. And uh, first, there's no plumbing. They had uh, our, our water came from a war surplus B-17 wing tank that he picked up at Boeing. And uh, that was our water system. And uh, so, yeah, it was... It was it was a slow start, and in, in fact, we had early on we we had a business set up there, and and uh, somebody from the county came by. And oh, well, it was from the city actually. We were an incorporated city, and somebody from the city came by and and uh, to inform us that we couldn't have a business there because we weren't zoned for business, <laughs> and uh, it was sort of the town the town sheriff, and then he. But then he also noticed that we were living there, and he says, "Well, I can't close down your home, so, so I guess I can't I can't close you down for that." And then he, and, and then the the city of Normandy Park, which is where we were, decided they needed a city office, and so they rented out space from us to be their city office, and then they they uh, zoned us for business in the course of that. So it was. Things were uh, moved fairly fast and loose in those days, apparently. So <laughs> anyway, we were allowed to stay. And so 49 onward, we had some, what we call the Northwest Archery Company. And uh, we, uh, my dad continued to make bows. And in fact, he launched a new project, which was asking himself the question if he wanted to be in the archery or in the bow manufacturing business. And he, he did, in fact. And he, he uh, we had a whole marketing system based around, uh, well, we had, he, he started building a bow called the Thunderbird in, in early 52. And then he made some broadheads. One of them was called the Thunderhead. 
One was called the Mickey Finn. Uh, he had, they were making lightning bolt arrows. <laughs> and, uh, and all these things kind of started simultaneously here. And, uh, but he, he set up to, he, he was well aware of what Bear Archery Company was doing and other companies were doing around the country where they had actually set up a, a, a shop or a, a bigger shop where a lot of bows could be made. And to take advantage of the new fiberglass material that, that came out from the war. And, uh, and the big difference with the fiberglass was is you could make a lot of bows, that, and they would be bows that would stay in one piece, which was... Which is always which a plus. Which is always a plus. <laughs> and it was always a problem with wooden bows. Uh, if you right, shot them a right. lot, you didn't know what was going to happen from when, you know, and, and a lot of bows broke and a lot of them got used. And, and uh, with the fiberglass, you could, you could create a, a line of bows that were kind of all the same and would all stay in one piece and would shoot arrows pretty well. And, and uh, so he thought he'd see if that's something he wanted to do. And uh, so... The, the bow plant part of the thing went uh, went along for, oh, about a year and a half. And during the course of time, he made about 350 bows. And he and he, he didn't hand make all those 350 bows in a year and a half by himself. He had some helpers. He mm-hmm. had people that would come in and, and work part-time in the shop. And uh, so it was quite a – but he had to be there to see what the heck was going on. Sure. And uh, – we had a we had a ready group of people that were field archers and our customers that uh, a lot of them worked for Boeing aircraft and uh, a lot of them were pretty good with their hands. Uh, some of them were engineers, some of them were model makers, pattern makers, and things like that. And and those are the people that came and helped in the shop and and uh, and worked with us on that. Plus all these guys that were there's some pretty terrific archers and. Uh, field archery in those days, uh, it was really what I would call in er- the early heyday of the NFAA. It's when it really took off. Uh, they had their first national back in '46 after the war, and then su- su- successive years after that, everything got a little bit bigger. By '53, the, the saying was is that we we can't build ranges fast enough, and it was true. There were about every 15 miles up and down the highway uh, throughout Washington, around Seattle anyway, there was another club that would start up. And uh, and they all had a 28 field course. Uh, so, you know, four, they'd shoot where you'd have targets from 15 yards out to 80 yards, and you'd shoot four arrows per target. And and the 28 course was a, a 14 was a complete course, but usually you'd shoot two of those in a weekend. And some or on a, on a, maybe on a Saturday you'd shoot a, a 28. You shoot two courses, and on a weekend you'd usually shoot a 56. And that's four arrows per target, 56 targets. That's a lot of arrows. They they shot 56s hmm. in one day uh, sometimes. So so these bows got a real workout and uh, and a lot of input. Uh, the, these guys knew what they wanted in a bow, uh, uh, and and ladies too. There were a lot of that was, these were families that were taking up archery, so you'd have the husband and wife and the kids, and, and everybody was doing it. And it was kind of just the ticket for returning, you know, GIs that had returned, and growing families, and they're looking for something to do on the weekend, and it was perfect. And uh, so that's that's kind of where the Thunderbird came from was the need for such a bow, and and. Uh, and the one he came up with, different from other bows at the time, it, there were a few guys making what they call full working recurves, where instead of the uh, like a straight-ended bow like the long bow or a, a static tip recurve like Bear mm-hmm. and other companies were making a lot of, where he had a kind of an L-shaped hook on the end of the bow, and they, they looked like a lot of early Asian bows and whatnot, but the tip didn't bend. It was just a lever. And uh, for the full working recurve, the whole art limb articulated, and you got a little bit more of uh, a little more action out of the whole thing. And, and also, they drew a little bit smoother, and they were a little more pleasant to shoot than some of the static recurves were. They didn't have quite a, a thunk at the end of the 
when you shot the arrow. They didn't jar you quite as much sometimes. And so that, so the Thunderbird was pretty successful. In fact, he, they, they made it as far east as Wisconsin with the national NFA nationals back there in, in 53. And a lot of the local clubs, you'd see pictures of the clubs. Uh, it would look like every other archer had a Thunderbird in their hand, you know. And mm. yeah, and, and Jay, who, who just out of curiosity, who was who was your dad's inspiration um, to to get started in? Well, I guess in archery and maybe even in 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 building bows as well. Well, he had he had played with archery back in the twenties, and uh, and uh, and he describes that in his in his books and whatnot. And then there was a there was a community of archers around Seattle that did a lot of archery on weekends. There was a, a pretty active target. And by active, I mean, you'd, you'd have a tournament and maybe 50 or 60 people would show up to shoot arrows, which was, you know, Seattle was a pretty tiny place back then. And, uh, but, uh, and there were several fellows that were, that were kind of an inspiration to him. And the, there was a Seattle archery club that met downtown Seattle in a basement and, uh, third Avenue. And, uh, and that he was active in that from the 30s and 40s and whatnot. And one of the uh, individuals that was uh, most active in all that was a gentleman by the name of uh, Cor. That's K O R E uh, Durier, K T Durier, uh, uh, D U R Y E E, <laughs> and uh, he was he was kind of the middle of archery. In the Seattle area, he did archery with the scouts. He was he was instrumental in uh, in in organizing most of the tournaments. Uh, he was active nationally in the National Archery Association uh, and the Pacific Northwest Archery Association that we had then. And he was a bow hunter, uh, and he had done some bow hunting up in British Columbia and. Uh, but still by the mid-30s, and actually throughout the country, no one had really, in the, in the United States, nobody had had what you'd call a bow hunting season. There was, what, I mean, a, a, a hunt that was for bow hunting only in a given place at a given time. You know, uh, and if you wanted to bow hunt, you could take your, or not take your bow, <laughs> you could take your bow and hunt in the rifle season. Right. And, and, and that wasn't even a given. It was a, uh, and I'm not even clear, I have to say, I'm not clear if you could, what the availability of hunting with the bow and arrow in Washington was, even in the rifle season. I know that Jury A made several trips up into British Columbia where you could bow hunt. He hunted up in Vancouver Island in the in the 20s and 30s. But in any case, finally in 1936, uh, they got their foot in the door. Uh, led by jury a and with my with my young dad sort of in, in tow uh, they got a season established in, in central Washington for bow hunting only it was a, it was a, a week long I believe it was in Chelan County and it was for mule deer and it was bow hunting only for that week and uh, gosh we had people up at that uh, an event People came from Oregon, uh, from, from Washington, into Washington, just to participate in that. Oregon didn't have anything like that yet, but they were working on it. And uh, so we hunted in 1936, and uh, by that time, Wisconsin—they were the first state to actually have a bow hunting only season. Uh, that was, and that was in 35. So we were the second state to, to do this. And uh, but we had to kind of redo it every year, and, and uh, so thirty-seven came around, and they had our uh, game commission meeting, uh, the citizen council that decided what happened with with hunting in Washington State, and uh, so they had a meeting, and uh, the uh, the county where we had our bow hunting season, and some of the some of the People in that county were unhappy with with us bow hunting, and so they came and complained. And by gosh, the commission shut bow hunting down. 
So they they told us no, uh, uh, or told my dad, and they told Jerry A that there was not going to no there's no 37 season. It's all gone now, and they were absolutely mortified. Uh, yes. And uh, so they they had a pretty late night brainstorming session together, and uh, and they went back the next day. And what my dad describes sort of a bended knee experience, they they begged their way back into it and, and got their season back again. And so we we were able to continue hunting. Yeah. So Jay, if if, I, if you don't mind me interrupting yet, um, so what was the complaint? They just didn't think bow hunting was a good way to go hunt. Was a good way to go hunting. It was just it was against the grain. People should hunt with rifles. They shouldn't hunt with bows and arrows. And uh, right. it was a silly way to to try to hunt big game. That so, was so. This wasn't this wasn't anti hunters. This was other hunters that just yeah bow yeah hunters. And there wasn't really much in the way of anti hunters. There was just anti right. bow hunters, anti innovators. Uh, there was just some guys that 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 uh, didn't understand why there should be a special season for for a bow and arrow and. Uh, and uh, a few landowners in the county, and some, I think a county commissioner was down on the idea. And, and it wasn't we had any specific complaints. They just didn't like the idea. It didn't make any sense to them, you know. And, and imagine that, you know, we, we're in a time where, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I guess look, looking at gift horse in the mouth. You know, something like that, where I, I mean, I can't even imagine wanting a season so badly and, you know, for something you love so much. And then today we have that. And, you know, to imagine not having it again and, you know, to have been like what, what your dad went through, or like the, the bended knee experience. I mean, can you imagine finally getting something or having something and then get it take, getting it taken away? Yeah. Well, that's a, yeah, and that's a, that's a good point, Nick. Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Jay. That's, you, that's, you know, when people that, that don't understand why so many of us are, uh, take the, the situation we've got going on right now in Tennessee, people are just up in arms about the, the airbow and you have people that just, well, I don't understand what's the big deal. That that archery only season, that bow season that so many have fought for in the past, could just go away. Uh, and in fact, you know, we're, we've already seen some examples in some states where they've reduced the archery season because of the crossbow has had such an impact on the number of animals taken. And and now you've got a state that's that's contemplating uh, introducing the airbow into the archery season. And it's not the weapon. I mean, the weapon. I don't have. A, I don't have a problem with the air bow as a weapon, but in general season, it just doesn't have a place in archery season. So, and I, I can imagine Jay that how much how you probably you know you're thinking about how your dad and Cor and others you know fought for that. I, I'm I'm sure you understand the frustration some of us feel. Oh yeah, yeah. It, the, the all these seasons are very hard hard won, and uh, and and they're based on. On limited ability of the of the uh, hunting imp- implement to harvest game. In other words, we're at a limited weapon season. Where and uh, it's uh, so anything you do to make the bow and arrow, or or if you put a, a much more efficient killing weapon in on top of a bow and arrow season, uh, like the crossbow or or like the air bow, it changes the whole dynamic. In other words, a we our our length of time in the field is based on the fact that we don't kill as many deer as as a rifle might kill in the same amount of time. And uh, it's, exactly, it's, and, uh, exactly the uh, oh, sorry, Jay. Yeah, um, no, I mean, uh, yeah. um, but the, pushing the limit of limited just seems ridiculous when you put it in that perspective. Well, and it, it ends like, your shortens your time in the field instead of say. Two weeks, they can kill the same amount of deer in one week. Well, we're going to have a one-week season instead of a two-week season. I mean, just to, exactly. just to carry that out like that. So, so uh, yeah, it's it, it and it never quits. You 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 think you've got your bow hunting established, but think again because it never ends. It's a it's a constant battle, and uh, there there's no such thing as a done deal. Uh, because 
there's um, gosh, I think something. Well, actually, something my dad said a long time ago. Just when you just when you get some something together and up and running, somebody comes along and wants to change everything. Well, that that's true of a lot of things, but it was certainly true in the with the bow seasons. And so, anyway, one thing I wanted to say about that is is that we my my dad remembered that. And he and he'd written about that, but he remembered what an experience that was getting that season back in '37, and and he says, "I, I we got to figure out some way to not have this be so hard for us. We've got to get bow hunting up on its hind legs. We got to get it established." And uh, so that became for him a number one goal, uh, and that's why he got involved with NFAA. Uh, that's where he put a lot of energy out of the archery shop into. We became kind of a central uh, clearinghouse for for ideas about about bow hunting seasons and uh, uh, organized bow hunting in the state. Uh, one of my early, early memories is our basement being filled with, with bow hunters meeting, talking about these very things uh, on, a, on a regular basis. We were kind of the, the meeting hall. And uh, so in one of the thoughts that my dad had was he, he was long aware of the Boone and Crockett Club. Boone and Crockett Club was uh, was established as a conservation club that to to uh, and, and, and their goal was to was mainly a conservation organization, hunters for conservation and hunters for hunting and hunters for for better game management throughout the country. And uh, but they they had a Impress, pretty impes, impressive uh, footprint. They'd established a, a, a record system where they could scientifically measure uh, characteristics of big game animals in the country, and in and, and, and doing so, kind of record what was happening to populations throughout the country, uh, what they're seeing, you know, population dynamics, how many big animals, what what was happening. It, it kind of painted a picture scientifically, uh, measurement wise. Of, of things and anyway that looked like a, a, a model that really could be followed maybe for a bow hunting and what my dad felt bow hunting and other people felt bow hunting needed to do is to show that hey we we can do this too we can hunt big game with a bow and arrow and we can harvest big game and we can be part of the 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 management scene we can we can have a role in in controlling game populations in wildlife management and and here we are and uh, so, with permission of the Boone and Crockett Club, they gave permission to use their record system uh, for a new club. And uh, it really started out as, a, as the hunting committee of the NFAA. And uh, at one point, my dad, was, my dad was the chairman of the hunting committee of the NFAA. And he asked the leadership of the NFAA if he could break off the hunting committee to start a new bow hunting only dedicated club. And, uh, and the leadership at the NFA at the time said, yes, you will, we'll give you our, our, uh, our endorsement on that. And, uh, so by, by 58, 57, 58, there was something called the Pope and Young Club. And uh, it didn't really get incorporated until later on, but they they had meetings back at uh, NFA uh, Nationals in '58, and then again in '59, and uh, and that was really the genesis of what we call a Pope and Young Club now. And what it was really formed to do was establish bow hunting, put high, bow hunting on its hind legs. And and the the early members of it, it was I well, started with less than 50 members but they were they were bow hunting leaders from around the country like-minded bow hunters that wanted to see bow hunting established and uh and manufacturers like fred bear uh were deeply involved in it from the get-go uh and uh so it was just an idea that that took off and and we still have that today but it's really cool to hear all that, how all that came together. I, I, as mm-hmm. many times as I've talked to you, we've kind of touched on it, but I think that's the first time you've ever really gone through exactly how Pope and Young 
was born. That's that's really cool. Yeah, it was it was interesting time, and uh, we had the club office. My my dad was the first president of it. We had the early planning meetings in our basement, <laughs> and the first interim board of directors was was formed from some of my lo- my dad's local Washington State people. We're the, we're the first planning board on it, and uh, and then and then it was taken back east to Michigan and and uh, and took off from there. But yeah, it was uh, our our store office was the Pope and Young Club office through. The early '60s, uh, my aunt was the first secretary of the club, and uh, so it was. Yeah, we were kind of in the middle of it, and it was kind of the middle of us, you know. And uh, that's that's what we kind of grew up with. And uh, yeah, and, and, and Jay, you've you so I know you've been heavily involved in in Pope and Young over the years, but you've also been involved in several other organizations as well so uh, you know maybe maybe dive into those just a little well bit. yeah it was i i i, I got in I, i've been involved at a state level which is really the the, the nitty-gritty for any state for bow hunting opportunity is with the state organizations and uh right and uh we in the mid-70s we we had uh the archery organization in the state the strong, the big archery organization was the was the Washington State Archery Association, and it was alternately called Washington State Field Archery Association, Washington State Bow Hunting Association. They they couldn't decide what they wanted to be called for a while, but it's and it still exists. It's it's our NFA affiliate, Washington State Archery Association. But in the mid seventies, there was a, a, a minor revolution that went on in there, uh, and. Again, we had a bow hunting committee of the of the WSAA that was not happy with the sponsorship they were getting from the, the organization. They they wanted some they wanted some travel money. They wanted some oh uh, they, they wanted some more support, <laughs> you know. And and the state association at the time wanted to spend the money on trophies, and they didn't really want to spend it on the hunting committee. So the hunting committee walked off <laughs> and started uh, something they wanted to call the Washington State Bow Hunters, which was a, a new club just designed to to further bow hunting access and opportunity in Washington State. Uh, no target archery, no nothing. Just but what they really wanted to be was kind of a pit bull for bow hunting. And, <laughs> and it was my best description of it. And, uh, and the uh, early president of that was a uh, was a fisheries biologist. He was federal fisheries fisheries biologist, but he knew he knew the management people and he knew the management system pretty much inside and out. And uh, and we had we had a young attorney that that uh, was part of the early, early leadership, uh, uh, Al Rinaldi, and uh, Chuck. Uh, Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember his name now. <laughs> it's terrible. Anyway, <laughs> we had some we had some really hardcore bow hunters, and and what they wanted to do is they wanted at the time what we had for bow hunting seasons in, in the mid '70s is we had these what we called postage stamp areas. We had about a dozen. Chuck Bartlett, excuse me, Chuck. Mm-hmm. If you ever hear this, anyway, he, and he 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 uh, he even took off his shoe at one commission meeting and to beat on the table with it, <laughs> sir, sir, Khrushchev style, you know. And uh, I remember that. Anyway, the uh, but we had these postage stamps, and they were we had about a dozen areas of the state that were open. Some of them fairly long periods of time, like our, the Nason Creek area, where we had where we had our Cedar Chalet. We talk about sometime here. The uh, that would be open from uh, September to the end of November. Uh, it's a long season, and it was for bow mm-hmm. only all that time. And uh, but it was still a, a really small area, and uh, so we had a bunch of those. But we didn't have a statewide, and one of the goals was to get a statewide season. And so we have the at one point in time we'd have the whole state open for for deer. In the whole state open for elk, and replace that 
replace these postage stamp seasons with with the ability to hunt anywhere in the state, you know, that was open. And right. so we had a uh, we had an old customer of ours that uh, in fact I worked with him the short period of time I worked at Boeing, uh, final assembly. We ended up working in the same plant. Anyway, this guy got to be a state senator, state representative, then a state senator, and uh, and he was on, as a senator, he was uh, he was chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, which is kind of a good thing. And anyway, he, he walked into her store uh, uh, one day and uh, hadn't seen him for a while, and he wanted to know what's going on in bow hunting. And I told him what was going on, and I told him what we wanted to do. And uh, so he, he he said, "Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it." And uh, and that was about uh, that was in the late seventies, early eighties. Mm -hmm. We we started off on on that uh, direction, and with uh, this gentleman's help, uh, we uh, and and the help talented committee we had anyway we got. We got it through things, and we eventually, by I think it was eighty six. Took a while, eighty eighty five or eighty six. We had our first elk statewide, so we had, and that was really a big deal. To be able to hunt elk anywhere, it it changed the dynamics of hunting in the state. It brought a lot more people into bow hunting, and uh, it 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 brought people in that were, but what we'd had primarily to that point was we had people that were archers first. They were archers that bow hunted. And uh, But what happened when we opened the statewide, all of a sudden we had rifle elk hunters that wanted to hunt in the bow season <laughs> because it was a better season. It was quiet. And sure. uh, so it brought a different bow hunter in. And, and some of those guys became some pretty hardcore bow hunters. Uh but that's what initially brought him in was was the opportunity to be in the bow season in a in that quieter time, hunting the same elk that they had hunted with their rifles because, uh, yeah, and 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 they picked up they they picked up a bow and learned how to shoot a bow so they didn't they didn't expect to to change the season so they could hunt it with a hunt during the archery season with a with a rifle they they picked up a bow and learned how to they shoot did. a bow they did and right. uh the, of course the compound bow is, was well established by that time and and the compound bow was was an easier transition uh than than our older recurves might have been uh you know for various reasons you know it, uh compound bows usually shot with a sight and you know everything that goes with a compound bow and and uh, so that was that was all part of the same same thing that that happened. And but yeah, and that and we've had so we've had statewide seasons ever since. And the same things were going on in states around us too. The uh, Oregon got a statewide, and and everybody was kind of working the same direction. And uh, and. But still, <laughs> every every year we still had to go back and work for it all over again. We had it, there was nothing that was even with the help of of Brad Owen as the was the uh, Brad Owen our our Natural Resources Committee Chair, State Senator, uh, went on to become Lieutenant Governor. He just recently retired, but he he uh, even with his help we still had to go back every year and, and uh, lobby for it all over again and so what we did was to do that and i think that's what most states do is you become very well acquainted with your with your state wildlife agencies and and all the different levels sure. of management and that mm -hmm. everything from the local biologists up to the directors you you become very familiar with those people in fact you become a familiar face in their office. You, you, uh, you drop in on them occasionally, and you go to all of the commission meetings, and you put a lot of effort into that. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, you go into a big game manager and uh, wildlife manager, and you'll you'll ask him, "What do you need? What can we help you with?" You know, you're our agency. You're the only agency we're going to get. 
we want you to be a great agency. What can we do to help you? And, and that kind of an attitude helped out quite a bit. So we, so we started our, you know, conservation committees within our organization and, and, uh, and that brought in other people. And, and what we always tried to do, and I, I, I had an advantage. I, I became state, Washington state bow hunter president in 88. And, uh, and it was just something somebody asked me to do, and I, I'd been, I'd, I'd been active, uh, you know, before that. But uh, at the time, we were the largest archery shop in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, and I, I probably knew more bow hunters personally than any one other person in the state, and and uh, and I and my dad and and the other po- folks that worked there, we had we had about a half a dozen employees at the time we were for a retail store we were for an archery shop we were we were good sized and so i i used that position behind the counter to recruit people to for state bow hunters you know i, I somebody come in the door that that look you know that i thought was really talented boy i do everything i could to get them on our on our our, our committee uh get them involved in the club and i and it worked <laughs> so uh, so Jay, was that Northwest Archery? That was Northwest then? Archery. Yeah, that You're was talking a, about yeah, right that now. That was a company we had, it. and uh, and I oh we you know I I tried to recruit talented people, and and we did that, and and I tried to re- also recruit people that I thought would have enjoy working with each other, would have fun together, and uh, and that's what we did. So we we had a lot of fun. We made it fun. Uh, First of all, it's it's fun being effective, and we were effective, and uh, but we got the couples got involved. We would travel, we'd move our meetings around the state, and the wives would come along, and it'd be like kind of like a, a social weekend, along with a big bow hunting meeting going on, and we'd we'd take it to other portions of our state so we could meet with the local bow hunters in those regions and whatnot, and and get them involved or help them get involved. So anyway, that. But, and that's just a that's just a great reminder of of for everyone just how precious these seasons are, and oh, that yeah. we, we can't yeah, take them for uh, granted. It's you you have to always fight for it. That's the that's the thing. So from seventy three onward, and then I and then I it was a big step for me to actually take on the presidency of the state bow hunters. It was when I took that on, I I. It being part of the archery shop, and it was, it was really part of what the store was about. I took that on as kind of a full time job when I did that when I, and for a while, and and uh, and, uh, and part of what was going on also uh, was, and it, it had to do with with hunting in the state. Is the uh, archery equipment had been marching forward and. Uh, and some of it looked pretty good. Some of it w- w- was aimed at, at these rifle hunters that wanted to take up bow hunting. Cause, not because they wanted to be archers, because they wanted to hunt in the bow season. And, I, right, and, I, right. and that's where mm-hmm. we started to get. I remember one customer in particular that came in and his statement was that uh, the one that shoots the most like a rifle, that's the one that I want. And, and, and that attitude was there. And that's... That's okay. It's still all hunting, you know, but that was not. That was a far cry from what we had as the the archer, that was the bow hunter also. So, and uh, some of it was frankly not really very attractive. Uh, there was uh, there was an increase at the time. This is like let's say late eighties. Uh, people began to shoot farther. Uh, some there were some shops that specialized in selling what they co- thought of as long range gear. You know, if you want to shoot a hundred yards, wear your outfit. You know, and and that kind of thing. And and that was really starting to grate on things. And uh, and it occurred to me at the time that I that I probably knew more bow hunters in the state than anybody else. I knew a lot of bow hunters, and I could organize things. And I and I and I was. Not a bad salesman. Is <laughs> this what I did all day long in the shop too? I, I talked to people, and uh, and I'm not as practiced at that as I used to be. But the uh, but it was an important time. And 
We also were getting word from, from our wildlife managers that they weren't too happy about this either. They were There were questions being raised throughout the West. And, and out West is different from Midwest back East in that we, we have a, a, a limited resource out here. As you notice, like in Washington and Oregon and Idaho and Montana and whatnot, usually you got one deer tag. You get one elk tag. That's all you're going to get. They, they don't have the deer surplus that that happens back in Wisconsin or back in New Jersey or some places like that, or, or South Carolina, <laughs> for instance. And uh, you got one tag in Washington. And uh, so if, if, the, if it looks like the, the bow and arrow is no longer a limited device, well, why should you have these big, long seasons? You know, let's, we, let's, let's cut you back down where you should be. Yes, and and as our as the bow the bows got more efficient, our efficiency began to show with our uh, with their statistics. You know, our harvest rates went up; they were going up, and and that's okay. Except we're also getting there's a there's a criteria for getting cut back for time of field, and uh, and it looked like from the feedback I was getting from our wildlife managers that was part of the package. Uh, you guys are not the primitive weapon you're presenting yourselves to be or that you once were. And, and that's it. Sure. That's so, a problem. So is that, is that where, yeah. the, so is that where the, uh, is that where you got the idea to start building, um, traditional bows and, and long bows and U bows and, and all of that? Well, it wasn't that at first it was, we'd already been doing that. We, when the, uh, there was, there was a backlash that came from the compound bow in the early 70s. When the compound bow began to be established, one of the first things that happened is people started shooting long bows again, which no one had been doing other than Howard Hill. And so it, the, 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 the compound bow ushered in a whole new level of, uh, a, a whole new generation of traditional archers. That these were guys that were recurve shooters, uh, and the compound came out. They tried the compound. They didn't like the compound. They'd seen the recurve. What's different? Well, none of us have shot the longbow. Let's go way back. Let's shoot the longbow. And that's why, well, you see it in Michigan, you know, they've got the, these longbow organizations. That's when they all started. Uh, they didn't start as traditional archery organizations. They started as longbow organizations. And uh, right. one yeah. of the first big shoots was the national or the uh, North American Longbow Safari that started in 81 was the very first one up in Canada. Uh, it was a longbow shoot. So anyway, that came back in there. And so this was going on. We were still, we were selling compound bows and we were selling traditional bows in, in 88. And, uh, but there was a, there was a time when I thought, and I shared the thought with my dad and with my brother, is there something we can do about this equipment thing? What can we do to make ourselves look better? What can we do to this bow hunting equipment's going in a kind of headlong direction? And is it going off over a cliff? Can we have an effect on this, you know? It was a question we were asking ourselves. And, and uh, we thought, well, let's let's see if we can. And and I had recently taken on the presidency of this, so I had, and I I had a honeymoon period as president to do kind of whatever I wanted to do. And I thought that let's see if we can let's see if we can put some rules in on on bow hunting that we don't have now. Let's see what we can do to curtail the equipment. What what'll happen if we try to do this? And uh, so and. We, I had had the experience of working with this organization. When, and when you want to do something, when you want to get bow hunting season, you want to get something and get done, you can't do everything at once. So you pick out some bullet points to work on. You know, so so sure. what can we do? We we could do maybe we could curtail the lead off of the bow and arrow. Some people were starting to build bows that had, uh, you know, the 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 standard bow at the time was sixty five percent lead off. Well, maybe we can work on. There's, there's some people trying to make 100% let off bows, which were a ridiculous idea. They didn't work at all. But, but let off was something we thought might, if if we could put some kind of a damper on that. And uh, and then uh, arrow weight. People were shooting these ultra lightweight arrows uh, at longer ranges. So well, maybe we can have mm -hmm. an arrow weight. 
and uh, and then electronics. There was a there was an ad out at the time where we had some guy that it was a full page ad on the back of a bow hunting magazine, and it was like a transponder that went to the end of your arrow. And this the, the, this horrible <laughs> ad, if you can imagine this, is here's so and so shot a this a bull elk uh, on on Monday. It's Saturday, and he's still looking for it. You know, oh yeah, okay. Well, he's, if, if he had his transponder on his arrow, he'd have it now. You know, he'd have found it. You know, big sales right. thing. And so, electronics, arrow weight, uh, and lead off, uh, and those are the things that we that we thought if we could get those three things in there, maybe we'll see what happens. Will the industry pay any attention to this? And as it so happened, we had a deputy director of the wildlife agency that was that was a traditional minded bow hunter, and uh, he came. In fact, when we had one of the things we had in the shop was we had we had our museum already somewhat established, and we had a, a collection in there. And one of the things we had in the collection were some flight arrows. And, and these are the kind of arrows people take down to the dry lake beds down in California and, and Nevada and, and shoot for distance and whatnot. Sure. And a standard, sure. one of the standard flight arrows at the time was, it was a carbon rod about uh, 17 inches long. And at the time, they were using injector razor blades for the, uh, uh, you know, for the fletching. So you've got injector eight blades in this tapered carbon rod, you know. And uh, and it occurred to me and Joe and Dad that, you know, this is a legal hunting arrow. <laughs> if these injector razor blades were just a little bit wider, you could take this out and go hunt elk with it if you wanted to. There's no restriction on arrow weight or anything at the time. And that was a little bit of a little hyperbola, and it was a little bit of a uh, a stretch, but it was a fact. And... We, we gave this arrow to my deputy director friend, and he walked into a wildlife department meeting, and he dropped that in the middle of the table and said, this is a legal hunting arrow in Washington State. <laughs> and it stopped the whole meeting, you know. And uh, it got their attention. And uh, so by, and this was like in March, and there was a meeting like in a wildlife commission meeting that we could access in like May. And so that was the goal to see if we could get this thing through. And, and we were able to go so far as to make this became the agency's plan. And all we had to do is support the agency. They picked up on this. And so it wasn't us trying to put this through the commission. It was us supporting our state wildlife agency to change the bow hunting laws. And it happened really quick. I had we had a unanimous board of directors uh, vote for my state bow hunters on this, and uh, so we took it to the commission at the May meeting, and it was it was very controversial, and it was the first time I'd ever done anything that that made a lot of our customers mad. Half our customers hated the idea, and uh, it was really going out on a limb, and. Uh, and but once we'd started, you know, it, it was it was like going to war. <laughs> we had to win. We had mm -hmm. to win. So we did, and uh, and we got that through. And so we were the first state that had equipment restrictions on bow hunting, and that and that's how it came about. For the for the time of between March and May, I was at every meeting everywhere. I was I was marching around the state you know, with, with this message. And, uh, you know, it's about all I did for, for two months. And, uh, wow. But yeah, that, and that was in, uh, that came about in the spring of 89. And, uh, and I, and in retrospect, it, it didn't accomplish a lot. It would be like telling people today that you, you can't really, you know, once you ring a bell, you can't unring it. And if, if it's like people with iPhones and you're 
your uh, the latest smartphones, telling them you got to go back to your old flip phones now. You got to get rid of those things. We're gonna, we're not going to do it smartphones anymore. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what people don't understand is that once you once something comes out like a crossbow or an airbow or some other major advancement, you can't put Pandora back in the box. You can't make it go away. I mean, no, no, <laughs> no. It's not going. It, it's not going backwards. It's just not. So you, um, you can su- you can suggest it, but you can't get rid of it. No, no. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's like raising the price of, it's like somebody telling you they're going to raise the price of parking temporarily until they pay for a project. And then, you know, that price is never going to be lowered again when people accept it, even after the project is long done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's the same thing. All like right. if once you get, once you give a little bit, you know, or let them take a little bit, they're, they're not, they're not going to give it back. And it, and it's the same with this. It's like, well, well, you know, yeah, you know, it'll it'll stop here. I mean, the slope is so slippery at this point. Oh yeah. Well, that if, if you've got you've got that that bow hunter that that was in my shop that wanted the one that shot the most like a rifle, and that was a real that was a real want on his point. That's what he wanted, you know. Uh, and uh, what I gotta ask, what did you sell him? <laughs> I, I, I sold him the I sold him the one that shot most like a rifle. You know, that's what I, we had. Which and we didn't we didn't sell all of the short, you know, the overdraw things, and we didn't sell all that stuff. But we, right, we 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 had boat, we had compound bows with sights on them. We had you know we had modern stuff, and we sold that. And then but. Today, a, a guy walks into an archery shop, and he sees a crossbow, and he looks at that, and he says, the same guy, the same attitude, says, well, you fixed my compound bow. You put a stock on it. That's wonderful, <laughs> you know? And that's what he's going to buy if he can. And, 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 well, if, know, and if we can get rid of the, you know, the air bow, same thing. Well, you got rid of the stupid bow on the end of it. Now all I got to do is shoot arrows, <laughs> you know. Because that those those limbs were really cramped. Oh no, style. Kidding. I mean, yeah. the animals I mean, were seen. What do we need that stuff for? You know, <laughs> I just want a gun that shoots arrows. You know, and uh, well, yeah. and you know, but Jay, <laughs> so. what, you, what you said earlier really resonated with me though. Like uh, a while back now, where you said archers first, who became bow hunters, and then hunters first, who became archers or bow hunters, and that I think that that distinction. Mm-hmm. Still, it still exists today. Well, it, here, oh, so, sure, sure. To does. that, to yeah. to that, to that point, Nick, and this is something I know Nick's heard me say it. And again, I'm not against any weapon. I, I, I really am not. I don't no. care. I, I got right. I, I've hunted with rifles for years. Uh, don't care to now, but I have. And Nick and I were talking about this the other day. I think both of us actually want to to get into doing a little black powder hunting, but that doesn't change the fact that. Archery seasons, bow hunting seasons, were designed as an exclusive season. Sure, sure. The general season is the inclusive season. So if you want to hunt with any weapon, that's what the general season is for. It's all inclusive. But if you want to hunt during the archery seasons, those are exclusive seasons, and they're designed to be harder. They're designed to be uh, – you're going to have to put forth more effort in learning to shoot another weapon, master another weapon, and – the idea is you have to learn or, or exercise better woodsmanship to get closer to that animal during that exclusive season. And what it's become is let's find however way we can make it possible to make it all inclusive. And that's not what it was about. And forget the, the hand. Well, I mean, this isn't about handicap. And, and if you want to justify that, you know, a crossbow is, is, is good for handicaps. Look, I get it. If somebody has been bow hunting their entire life and, sure. and, and they've had an accident, and they, you know, or an injury, and they need to pick up a cross. But hey, more power sure, to and them. That, and that's I, I'm not happening. Talking about that's that. happening everywhere. In fact, we've got laws that you can't hold back disabled people. You know, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No. I, and it, but but it's sure. still the 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 season was established. It was fought for by our forefathers, our bow hunting forefathers, for an exclusive season for hunting with limited range. Equipment. It's it's not about. It's, I can it, take an airbow yeah, and put a, put a whatever in it. It's about it. that word limited. It's about limited capability. And uh, and if you remove the limited capability, you know have a, you know no longer have a need for that season. And what you would get is eventually just one big inclusive season. And uh, 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is where we're headed. I I think, I think that's, that's where, uh, if things continue the way they're going now, at best, I think that's where we're headed is back to a one general open season. Well, in in a lot of places though, in the Midwest and in a lot of areas that, the, the wildlife agencies don't want a high power rifle in there. They don't have room for high power rifles everywhere. They they can't right. put those in a suburban mm-hmm. environment. And and so the bow and arrow was a, was a perfect device to you know for suburban environment and whatnot. And and but so also for a lot of these agencies that if they want to harvest lots of game, a lot of animals, they could put a crossbow in there. And and frankly, they could put an air bow in there and do the same thing. And it's, and I, they're not, to, you know, to the agency's credit, the agency is not in the business of managing types of weapons that people use. They, their main business in a wildlife agency is to manage wildlife. And they, sure. they're, they're forced mm-hmm. to manage people at the same time, but mainly they've got wildlife management goals they have to reach. And, and in a suburban environment, with, with, with they've got a number of deer they want to harvest, they're, they're going to pick the way that works best for them, that works, does best for their budgets and all that sort of thing, and then still provides recreation. And uh, But yeah, I, and I, personally, I'm, I'm not against weapons either. I, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against compound bows at all. Uh, but everything has to be you know, to fit into it. I, in fact, I don't I see. I don't think we need traditional only seasons. We've got some people working to that. And we've had, we've had a few traditional only seasons, but compound bows and long bows and recurves, we get along pretty good, well together out in the woods. Our, our harvest rates are similar enough. We're a lot stronger if we all work together on that. That's what we ought to be doing. And uh, certainly we can have, we can have, traditional only clubs and things like that and, and, and promote traditional bow hunting. But we, it, it, we're enough similar enough that we can work together. And uh, uh, it, if all of these types of, of hunting are valid enough that they sell themselves and in, 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 in all these types of, of uh, there's a recreational component to to using a shooting a compound bow, to shooting a long bow, shooting a recurve, people recreate with them all. Uh, I don't know that there is a recreational component to the air bow. I, I shouldn't speak against it necessarily, but it's 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 not a bow anymore. And uh, right. and, and a crossbow is different. It's still got a bow, but generally it's it's you know it's a different weapon than the compound bow and. Uh, so yeah, it's a complicated deal, and I, I, but I, the idea of, of fighting, uh, and uh, we need to we need to get together where we can get together, and uh, and I think that's getting that's being done pretty well. I, I don't see people fighting the compound bow per se anywhere right now, and and we shouldn't be. Uh, it's 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 still out oh, there. Yeah. I, I, I'm afraid I, I still see it. And and as you know, Nick and I talked about when we started putting this thing together. You know, that's uh, that's one of the things we actually discussed when we were talking about you know the whole traditional outdoors in the podcast. And and you know we're you know, the, the compound the compound thing is uh, it, there's several reasons I'm I'm not a an advocate against compounds. I shot one for a long time myself and. You know, it's it's here to say it's here to stay. Excuse me. I would definitely agree. It's it's easier having now you know been shooting uh, traditional gear for many years, but um, there's still a level of of uh, skill that's involved with it, and there's still um, a level of you 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 do have to practice. You do have to put in your time if you're going to be um, if you're going to be effective with it. So. Yeah. Um, but Jay, but Jay, I tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to pull you back in. I know this is an area that you're definitely passionate about and we've, we've had some really good discussion. Um, but I, I, we're, we've probably got about 10 minutes left here and I really would like to, to close this on a, a positive <laughs> note and let you talk a little bit about, 
um, you know, some of your, your hunting experiences and maybe just keep it at for now where, you know, um, animals that you've pursued and maybe the, the different states that you've hunted in over the course of your, your bow hunting career? Well, yeah, we can do that. And I, and I guess what I, the, uh, uh, yeah, I, we, I've been around it for a long time and I, in my bow hunting career is spans quite a period of time and, uh, different activities. And I started out hunting in, in Washington state, of course, and, and, uh, accompanying my dad on mule deer hunts up in the North Cascades and Central Cascades. And, and uh, that was an, indel- an indelible period of time and, uh, getting to know the, the, the folks that he chose as hunting partners and who those people were and, and how they hunted and all that was uh was quite memorable and I, again these guys were archers that also bow hunted and uh and that's who everybody was at the time pretty much in, in the in the you know in the mid 50s and uh in mm-hmm. the 60s and whatnot and so and then we we've always had elk hunting in the state in some degree and my dad got interested in elk hunting back in the in the in the mid fifties, that's the, that's the Roosevelt. Primarily elk, right? the Roosevelt elk, although we've got we've got a good Yellowstone population and a Roosevelt's population. So uh, his attention was drawn early on to to the Roosevelt's uh, over in the Olympic Peninsula, and uh, and also the ocean in general. And uh, by the mid sixties, my dad had bought some ocean property down on the ocean, so. Partly to, just to be able to enjoy the ocean a bit, you could buy property right on the ocean at the time, and uh, so we had about 140 feet of uh, uh, of frontage on the ocean that was about a quarter mile deep at the time. And uh, the part of the impetus there was to be able to have a base of operations to go elk hunting out of too. So we, so we, there there was kind of a an annual campaign to to go and try to harvest the rows of elk elk and uh and uh yeah now have you taken both both roosevelt and Yellowstone? <laughs> no Hills? no in fact no in fact i haven't taken either one <laughs> I, of all the hunts i've been on i've been close and i did close calls and i've 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 done campaigns for a year or two but i never made really never made elk hunting a, a big priority it was it was never my big giant goal to go, you know, to go uh, uh, harvest an elk, or I haven't really turned it into a campaign enough so that I got one. Sure. I, I remember I, the first time I went uh, hunting with a U bow, uh, I it was a uh, this was eighty seven, and I and I had a self U bow I'd made, and uh, Jay Massey and Doug Borland were coming down from Alaska to hunt Roosevelt's elk with me. And so I, I decided, well, those guys are coming down. I got I to gotta put my fiberglass longbow down, which I was shooting at the time, and I got to get my U-bow out. <laughs> and so, and I had a, I had a, a, a nice five point in front of me. Uh, we were hunting on the outskirts of the Olympic National Park, and we were well on the outside of the outskirts of it, but we were, you know, in that, on the far western edge of that. And, uh, I had this big, uh, big bull show up. I was I was following these elk tunnels, and these things are so big and they're so brushy and thick around there. The elk make these tunnels that they travel through, and uh, so I was doing. And I came around a corner, and here's this big body of a, a bull elk. Obviously, and it was about 15 yards, and all I could see was its was its body, but I couldn't see its head. And at the time, you you had to it had to be five, a cow or five point or better. So, right. and I didn't know what the heck this was. I couldn't tell what it was. It's just a big elk, you know. And it was, I can remember breathing there, and and then it finally walked. It was, this head was behind this huge cedar stump, you know, and then it finally walked forward, and then I could see its head, but its body was behind this big cedar stump, and I could see it was a was a five point. It was a legal bull, and uh, and and then the thing took a right angle turn and went away from me directly with his cedar stump in my way. So I couldn't do anything with him. And, uh, 
that's about the closest I've been to a Roosevelt since, and I haven't really, I haven't, I have, I've been on a lot of hunts with no, with no elk. You know, you don't see elk every time. You can, you got to find it. You got to find them. And uh, but I, but I know you've taken, I know you've taken some 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 mule deer. I've taken some mule deer in Washington State and in, and in Oregon, and uh, and I and I've and I've uh, for a long time. I I love hunting alpine mule deer. I haven't taken a big mule deer, and uh, we for a long time. What I do is I go up in the high alpine in the in the late summer and try to find pockets of, of mule deer up there, partly because I just love that country. I like to be up in the alpine, right. and uh, and so I've done I what we would call our annual mule deer wild goose chase up in the high alpine, and uh, so I did that kind of thing for quite a while. Uh, I, I had an opportunity to, uh, to hunt in Canada uh, for caribou uh, back in the mid-'80s, and uh, the star was doing pretty well. We were able to go on some hunts at the time. And, uh, and so, yeah, I went to, I went to Quebec uh, caribou hunting in 84. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the Labrador That's the Quebec, Quebec Labrador, yeah. So right. I went up there at 84, and then I went back in 86 up there and uh, and was successful on those trips. And uh, Now, is that is the, the, the labor, is that a, a migratory type hunt, or is that just a, like a, a... Yeah, it is migratory. Spot. It is migratory. I and got they, you. They, uh, so they need, generally they have, they have camps set up that, that are placed so that they'll, you know, there'll be caribou coming through, you know, at the time that the season's open. And, uh, and, and usually that was the case. And it, back in the eighties, there were an, an awful lot of Quebec Labrador caribou. And, uh, so you could go up there and you could plan on seeing a lot of animals and you would see a lot of animals up there. And, uh, and it was a, uh, it was a real, real eye opener and, uh, being able to hunt in an area that, that was, so empty of people, but but so full of game at some time or another, sure. and 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 also a country that that did not probably look any different than it might have looked, you know, ten or eight or ten thousand years ago. Uh, you know, you could an area where you could march off in any one direction for hundreds of miles and not bump into anything, you know, and uh, so that was pretty fantastic. So we did that, and then I I had an opportunity to go to Northwest or Central Canada caribou hunting up above Great Slave Lake, and uh, and I became very fascinated just by I, I love the country up there. I love the the tundra, and I love the I love the north, and uh, mm -hmm. so I I made a, a number of trips up into Central Canada also during that same you know rough period of time, and. Uh, that's when I had a chance to do something. That's what I would pick, and uh, so yeah, that's that was it was kind of its own episode. And uh, now things have changed up there, uh, and the seasons that we once once had are in Quebec and in Northwest Territories. Uh, those those big caribou hunts are no more at the time. They the caribou are sort of a cyclical animal, and uh, I remember talking to a biologist in northern Quebec back in the 80s. Uh, we ended up at a table with uh, with the, their chief caribou biologist uh, one day, and uh, but he he says that he told us that you know back in the early 50s you couldn't hardly find a caribou up here. Uh, there just weren't any, and then they they blossomed to where they you know were uh, oh. Three or four hundred thousand herd up there in the same area, right. and uh, but he told us at the time in 80, 80, this was eighty four. He says the calf weights are dropping right now, and so something's going on, and uh, so we think they're probably on the down move, and uh, and they were, but it and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with hunting, and, and they're not sure what it has to do with yet. There's the researchers are all out to lunch on that. But anyway, so yeah, I, I, so, I did a lot of caribou hunting for a while. So, Je 
and I, and I know you've hunted, I know you've hunted whitetail. I know you've hunted uh black bear. And I think we, we sent some stuff back and forth on Facebook, mountain goat. And I, I know you've hunted feral hogs cause yeah, I was there yeah. for that. But uh, what, just, you know, what, uh, I guess, I guess two questions and then we'll, we'll probably wrap this, put a wrap on this one. But if you, if you would, what, what's your, um, what's been your favorite location to hunt and what would you say has been your favorite animal to hunt? And they may be one and the same, but. Gosh, that's a tough one, really. The uh, I love hunting high country mule deer. And uh, not that I've, it, 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 you know, I like being up in the alpine. I, I had a one really good hunt up in uh, uh, in Wyoming, uh, in an area called Little Grays. And we were, uh, it was above, oh, it was near, we, in fact, we parked at a place called Periodic Springs, and uh, it's right over by the Idaho border. And mm-hmm. we hunted. We were hunting at uh, between eight and nine thousand feet, and seeing some fantastic deer. Uh, we didn't. We didn't come home with any, but it was one of these things where you spot and stalk sort of thing. You'd, you'd kind of put the deer to bed, you know, and the you'd, you'd you'd be out just before. It, it got light, and you'd try to spot some deer going to bed up on a high hillside, and then you'd go try to do a sneak on them. And uh, so your, you know, your your stalk or your emphasis of the warning was on a specific animal, and uh, and it was a lot of fun doing that sort of thing. Uh, although I think that from a pure majestic standpoint, uh, and hunting hunting caribou. Uh, in an area where there are a lot of caribou and you see a lot of caribou, uh, you know, knowing that you're going to go out in the morning and you're going to have an interaction with, with some fantastic animal every day almost, uh, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> and and because it, you know you're going to get the opportunity, you you make your opportunities. What we what I generally do up there was was kind of like a, uh, 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 a what you'd call a stalk to an ambush, mm-hmm. and you you'd find some animals and you try to figure out what the heck you're going to do and try to get yourself in the in their way. And uh, I had one instance where I had I had four bedded bulls that were all nice bulls. In fact, any one of those bulls, I had just would have been just a wonderful bull to take home, and uh, this was up in central Canada. And I, so I took my boots off and I crawled up on these things with my stocking feet, and uh, and I, and I got within probably about forty yards of them or so. And I was moving really slow. I was trying to be a moving rock. I was a rock that was moving very slowly, and and uh, and then hail got up. And started feeding towards me. <laughs> they bought me off as a rock, and uh, <laughs> and I was I I had wool. You know, I was dressed in wool, head to toe. I had a wool checkered shirt on. I wasn't all camouflaged up. You know, I just I just had wool on. And sure. uh, and these things started feeding around me. I had four bulls at every quarter of the compass. You know, around me and maybe 10 yards away or so. And these, these particularly bulls are, they're cautious in a way, but if, if they buy you off as part of the landscape, they seem to buy you off completely. And they, they, they know what a grizzly bear smells like. They know what a wolverine smells like, and they hate those things, but they don't know what a person smells like. They just, they, right. they're not that scent oriented and, uh, but they're hugely movement oriented. And so I was kind of trapped. I, 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 I was. I, I would look out of the corner of my eye and think, "Well, that bull's—he's got—he's angled just right. That's—I got to take that opportunity." And then there's, no, oh, now he's turned, and this one over here looks like you know. So, <laughs> so this went on for a while, and I, I had a, I had an Indian guide watching me, and I, he told me, see, later, he said, "I was just going nuts. I don't know how you, how this was all going to turn out," and. So finally, I, I oh, this is there's that opportunity. This guy's angled right. I can get an arrow, and I so I raised up, and of course they all kind of 
you know. They saw that rock they was all moving. Went, <laughs> yeah, they all went ape, you know. And, and, and they took off and they went out about 50 yards or so and stopped and looked at me, you know. And so I kind of let him go. And so that was all blown. I didn't shoot an arrow. Nothing happened, you know, with that thing. And uh, so I went back and got my pack and got my boots on and whatnot. And they were still out there, these four car- caribou. And I, I, and they moved farther out. And, and I'd get up with about 50 yards of them, and then they'd move on again. And, and I bumped them. I, I spent the whole afternoon playing with those things, you know. But no, never, got, never a got a shot. Never got, in fact, at one point, I thought maybe I can make him mad at me. I could challenge him, you know. <laughs> you know, in any because you don't know what they're going to do. You know, I've had right. You know, sometimes, if you you have a group of caribou, and and you go run at them, they'll come and run at you. Uh, they don't know what they're going to do. You don't know what they're going to do. So, right. and, and you got nothing to lose because. Chances are good you're going to get up tomorrow morning and find some more caribou, you know. So it's it was it, everything was just a big experiment, you know, <laughs> and what's going to happen. So I never did get any those those caribou, but it was a, it made a very memorable afternoon, and and every it, I, it I sure couldn't make a like mad at me. <laughs> well, Jay, I tell you what, um, I think we're going we're going to stick a pin in this one. Um, it I can just tell we've probably got hundreds of other hunting stories we could probably uh squeeze out of you and we we may have to do that sometime soon but uh i i i just want to say how much i've enjoyed having you uh having you on the on the podcast tonight and 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 talking to us and especially the 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 history lesson and you know the how these how the the archery seasons got founded but Thank you so much. We yeah, really appreciate it. Absolutely. I've just been kind of sitting here, just kind of taking it all in, fascinated. So I I really appreciate it, uh, Jay. Well, thanks for having me, fellas. It was good talking with you. And uh, uh, so pleased pleased to be here. Well, we'll 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 have you on again real soon, real soon. Well, Nick, I thank you for thank you for joining me as always, buddy. Yeah, happy to be here. All right, guys, y'all take care. Well, folks, we sure hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and you have not already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so you are notified whenever a new episode is released. Also, please take the time to leave us a review on your favorite podcast listening app. It helps us grow in the rating so more people can be introduced to our traditional approach to the outdoors. Until the next time, get out there and enjoy our great outdoors. And if you can, be sure to take a kid along. Be safe, be responsible, and be sure to set a good example for your fellow outdoors men and women. So long, everyone.